Okay. We are up and recording. All right. Hey, so, you know, we'll just go 55 minutes. Um, it is a very short time for me to cover things. Um, but what I've done is just basically done uh, four videos per stroke. And what I've decided to do, instead of going through like every single thing that I look at and think about, uh, I've decided to do like one or two things that I think are foundational and then one or two things that I would say are a little bit different and unique. And maybe, I mean, maybe they're not to everybody, but, um, you know, just something I want to be able to stir some thought. Uh, obviously in a time when, gosh, naturally and organically, we can't get together as coaches and talk swimming and trade ideas and get that inspiration. Uh, obviously just kind of in your own little bubble of your swimming world. And so, you know, those meets are those opportunities to typically where we trade ideas and get ideas uh, and see different things from happening. So I'm hoping to be able to help provide that. Um, I'm gonna just like jump into this because I have no idea where I'm gonna be after or where, how far I'll get after 50 minutes. I always run out of time. So uh, like I said, for three or four things per stroke, I'm going to share my screen and um, and then we'll just go from there. I have a, a playlist kind of that I just set up for you guys. So hopefully um, I'm just sharing this one window, I think. Can you guys see this one? Uh, right now it's a, it's, yes. Okay, you can't see it. Okay, good. Um, let me switch to the front. So this is my basic like freestyle foundation thing. It is um, basically the catch. Uh, I'm all about this kind of elbow bend needs to happen. If you're looking at a swimmer from a front view and you could see it from above water too. Uh, this is Katie Ledecky, Townley Haas. Mallory Comerford, I think this, yeah, this is Nathan right here. So you got your mid D, mid D distance, and then two sprinters right here. Um, you know, you, they shape, the shape is a little bit different as you move through this. Um, but I, I think in general, what you're trying to get is this position right here to some degree. And I think Katie's and Townley's, Katie's mostly is kind of, like the one that I try to model and picture and like focus after. So I think like I look at hers, but you know, and as we look at sprinters, I think typically they, I don't know, like don't have as strong of a catch, don't have as sharp as the catch when you look at it. But I do think going for that and not having that straight arm, just straight down, looking straight down your arm is what you want. Um, I did ask Katie if I could share this next video and I love what she was doing here. Like I didn't, I don't know where she got this from. I mean, it's not a, it's not a unique drill, but why like, like she had choice of drill and this is her choice of drill, which is just like doggy paddle basically. It's a little bit more than doggy paddle cause she's pulling all the way through, but just an underwater recovery. Um, so yeah, just, Kind of hitting your catch and obviously you could see that elbow position from that top view and then she's pulling all the way through and and then some um but getting it on both sides um you know getting that catch on both sides you know you could just shorten it to just the just the front part of the stroke and just having it as a doggy paddle and like why does this work i was thinking about it works because like when you're not taking full strokes you're not rotating over rotating you're not like people aren't really moving the shoulders a ton and i think that's really why it works and and i think that's a key to try to translate when you start getting into full strokes and like obviously like when you get your arm out of the water that's a big place where people's rotations get pretty big and and impacting that so just even if you were to just have like a straight up doggy paddle like you don't you, you you're more likely to see this kind of catch action, like you don't see anyone doggy paddle with a straight arm. 
And it's just because like the lack of rotation or the minimal rotation, let's say it's, it's not no rotation, but just the appropriate amount of rotation happens when you're not, when you're, when you're not recovering over water and when you're just like moving through that catch motion. So I think that's a really key thing to think about when you're moving through these and and moving through the catch and trying to focus on that is what what's happening with the rotation um i'm zooming through this because like i said i don't want to run out of time so we're just moving through things i'm gonna try to use less words than i typically do uh this right here like obviously with this small kind of intimate audience like i'm, I'm also telling you guys who these people are too uh this is gretchen walsh um, obviously one of our really awesome young freestyler sprinters, great catch right here. What I wanted to show here is what she's doing with the finish. And I see this like so much more now, and I notice it a whole lot more now than I typically do. Um, you know, really emphasized in the front part and not so much like pushing like this part right here, where she starts leading with the elbow and really keeping pressure with the water on her with her hands and forearm i see this a whole lot more across people uh and actually a whole lot more of sprinters it's it's really noticeable i think because the sprinters typically have like are a lot deeper on the front part of their stroke so when they when their arms come back out to exit out the water what they're doing here is very very evident so really not locking out the arm on the finish and like if anything like leading with the elbow and just keeping pressure with the forearm and the hand. I love this. And like Caleb is, especially with how deep his hands get on the catch, it is so noticeable with Caleb. Simone does it. Katie does it. So many of our freestylers do it. Like, and, and I don't know if they're necessarily like focusing on, okay, let's not really like push water out. And, and yes, they are obviously having a finish. But I do think it's really interesting right here what's happening. And um, yeah, just keeping pressure with the hand and forearm and, and getting some elbow bend, like bending the elbow to, in order to enable that to happen. Again, like really emphasizing in the front, but not in that traditional, like I would say locking out the back, like that kind of really overemphasis on the finish. So just like I said, it's like it, like I said, it was an appropriate amount of rotation, an appropriate amount of pushing out the back with the finish. And it's just, like I said, just really interesting how this, I see this happening more and more or, or noticing it a whole lot more across different athletes. And then bringing it back to basics, this is uh, just some kicking right here. And what I, and actually I was just like, as so many of our best athletes are honing in on very technical things. And actually Katie Ledecky and I were just texting about her kick this past week and what she's been trying to do. And typically what she, she has is like her, her feet are coming out of the water a whole lot when she tries to really rev her kick and like, I think what we want to do is just shift that to be deeper. Um, these are all really, really good kickers. And what you see is the depth in the kick when it finishes. Um, all of these athletes, the feet are finishing below their body line. Um, I'll tell you who these people are. I mean, this is Luca right here. Uh, this is Simone. We have Reagan Smith. We have Carson Foster, like really good kickers. Um, you know, three of the four of them, 18 and under as well. Um, but just a really good range of motion through the legs and just through that, through that kick depth and through that finish. I think that's the key. So, you know, starting with bending the knee below the body, in front of the body, however you want to say it. And then just kind of whipping that all the way through, getting some good depth through that kick. That's where you get the power. It's not necessarily through tempo, 
of the kick as much as just like a good range of motion and pushing water deep. I mean, Katie has said like her feedback this week was like, it's definitely a lot harder for her to make this kick a lot deeper than it is for her. Like typically her whole foot is coming out of the water and that's what she goes to typically. That's typically what she's gone to when it's like, okay, let's kick more. Her whole feet come out of the water instead of like just shifting it forward and shifting it deeper. So just something to think about um, as you move through, obviously you have your kickers, your good kickers and not so good kickers on every team. Um, and there is, you know, most of it is not for lack of effort <laughs> as much as, but that's kind of what we go to, to try to improve kicking is like repetition and effort. Um, but there is a technical aspect to it too. And just finishing it all the way through. Um, moving on to backstroke, we might even have time for questions. Um, the catch. I mean, that's the foundational thing that I go to. And I like a shallow stroke or more shallow than, like, I like it more on the shallow side than deep. This is Missy, who's probably the most shallow of our great backstrokers. Uh, and you can see her fingertips are right under these this lane rope or right out on the lane rope. And um, that's tip, that's where she always had her pull. Just keeping it out to the side getting an awesome catch, like really engaging her entire body right here. I think the key is not, you know, her hand never pushes down, water down at all in this front part of the stroke. And just, yeah, just keeps it out to the side. And Miss is really the only backstroker that is that shallow. Um, this right here, I think this is Ryan Murphy. So obviously pushing a little deeper. Um, but in doing so, same as Missy, not really like the palm never faces down when he does that. Just pushing water back, keeping the arm to the side. And this right here is Rachel Bootsma. That video is a little bit more blurry and Aaron Pearsall and Pearsall. Yeah, he was the first one that I would say I noticed doing this. Just like, gosh, this is clearly moving water back and moving him forward. And again, not pushing water down toward his feet, just keeping the palm facing. Like there's a little bit of flashing right there, flashing down. But for the most part, keeping the arm out to the side. You know, looking at this from a side and a front view, this is Tyler Clary. And you can see how much the arm is out to the side at the same time he's hitting the catch. So keeping the arm out to the side, keeping the rotation pretty, I would say, again, appropriate, like not over rotating, keeping it more, he's more on his back than he has on his side. And um, just keeping that arm out to the side so that he can have a great catch and really I would say we've been so fortunate to have so many great backstrokers in the US and they all exhibit some kind of this motion. I will say that like many of our female backstrokers from Reagan to Kathleen Baker to Olivia Smoliga, they actually have a little bit, they, they tend to be pushing a little bit deeper with their strokes. I think a lot of it is also due to the fact that those, like a lot of our female backstrokers typically well, those three in particular have like really mobile shoulders, so they can afford to be pushing a little bit deeper out of the typical range of motion. Um, you know, and, and I think obviously as everybody, like you just kind of roll with the exception, the exceptions and kind of have to figure out what is working versus and why it's working for them versus like what most people should be doing. Um, in backstroke, you look at, and you can see it here with Tyler, like once he gets past kind of his chest, a downward finish, and like the hand is finishing below the hip, kind of popping his hips over to get that next rotation. And that leads me to my next slide. This is Missy, again, from the top view. Um, and, you, and what I'm trying to show here 
is that this finish, this motion right here, kind of inward and downward, is what pops that rotation to the other side and gets you that good timing that you're looking for. So I think this is key to being able to rotate into your next stroke so you don't feel like you have to push downward. Like if you can rotate on time, you'll be able to get your next catch. And that rotation on time is very much to me dependent on being able to use your finish to be able to drive that hip over, you like kind of get that rotation as, as one unit through your core and really kind of power, like move through that stroke that way. Um, this example, like this is the, an example of a good rotation timing and a not so good rotation timing. So they're, they're the same here, like kind of moving into the finish. They're both rotated to the left side. This is Missy down here. Um, Missy is entering, her, they're both entering their hands now. And you see Missy's entering right above her shoulder. She's kind of flat at this point. And this other athlete right here is entering. She's entering right now. And you can see like kind of rotated to the left side still. And like so many of you have athletes, I'm sure, that like are entering way above their head. And to me, like the reason to eliminate that is because typically an athlete that enters too narrow is going to use then like push down with the hand to get the next part of the rotation. Because when they're entering too narrow, they're typically rotated to that left side. So they're, or they're rotated to the wrong side at the time. Like Missy's flat when she's entering right here. And this athlete here is entering over her head and rotated to the left side. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense why you would want to get, like why you're trying to fix that. And then how you do it, it's, I think it's connecting with that finish arm and like really feeling it through your core um, and through the, like having a good core to be able to do that. And that's my backstroke spiel. Four clips. Uh, breaststroke. And again, like we're not going to go through highlights. So many of you have heard me speak so many times. So uh, these are just the highlights. Um, shape of the stroke. Like I think a lot of us pretty much agree, would agree that like kind of being a little bit wide out here. Um, and then I, I think one of the important things about that is that you like, there are two reasons. One, I think you are much stronger in general. People are much stronger when you go from wide to narrow, like when you're trying to go pull from outside inward towards your body. So I think that is a whole lot stronger. And then like, you really want to be smooth in this transition right here. And so to go from wide to narrow, like if you were to just pull straight back, it just, it won't lead to a smooth, quick transition. So that's the whole reason to have that pull shape um, where you go from wide to narrow. So you're strong in this kind of really propulsive movement once you go from wide inward. And then, um, and then yeah, to be able to have that really smooth shape through the pull right here, through that transition to, into the recovery. And this is tracing the, tracing the shape of the hands. Um, it's interesting because through this, I'm also gonna advocate for having a good catch. Um, these are four of our very best athletes. And you'll see, like, I see this trending, like people moving towards this a whole lot more now. And so it's having a combination of like having that pull shape, but then also doing it in conjunction with getting your elbows up. Um, this is Lily King right here. Obviously she is so dynamic in her pull. This is Annie Laser, like really more of a 200 breaststroker. And 
This is Josh Crino, again, like much more of a 200 brush stroker. And Andrew Wilson, who's 100, 200, uh, probably leaning a little bit more towards the 100 side, but obviously, uh, you know, a top eight in the world in both 100 and 200 as well. So like having this catch and like, I spent a lot of time with Ray Luz and that is, this is such a huge point of emphasis too. So I think it's trying to find that balance. Like you don't want someone to get the catch and just pull straight back, but it's like having that shape, but then also getting the elbows up, especially I think as you're kind of trying to round, round the corner to get into that inward transition. And I'll play this all the way through. It is like <laughs> watching breaststroke pull from in a slow motion view is like every single time still blows my mind because there's so much to look at in a breaststroke pull from like how wide the hands are going to when they get the catch to how deep their hands end up going. It's like you look at Annie and you look at Lily and Josh Andrew keeps his hands a lot, a lot higher, a little bit more shallow, but this is what I'm used to seeing with like in these three, this de hand depth is what I'm used to seeing like with Kosuke Kitajima and a lot of the like great brush strokers in history. And I think, yeah, like I said, my mind gets blown just like looking at this position right here and how, like, I think we often focus in, on the shape of the pull and it's so hard because the brushwork pull is like you there's a outward and inward movement there's a front and back movement and then there's also like a there's a, a depth to it so your hands are going deep and then coming back up to the surface too um but yeah i think it is one of the things that obviously leads to some complexity but i you know simply i would say like focus on the pull shape the shape of the hands and then like think about how do you incorporate a good catch into that as well. And I do feel like internationally it's moving that way too. Obviously you don't want like, and you know, for a long time I um, was not an advocate of really trying to get a big catch because I felt like people would lift their head way too early once they got their elbows up and their hands down. Uh, so still keeping your head in line being patient with the breath. And you could see that in this clip, um, just when the breath is happening too. And obviously these guys are having so much patience. They're breathing, like their head is breaking the surface on like as their hands start coming inward. So having some patience through there. And I have two more breaststroke clips and um this one is about the kick and if you've heard me talk in the last couple of years you'll know that i've been saying this is like i really like this is happening really fast real time i've slowed this down obviously like having a downward finish to the kick i think really helps the hips get high and you'll see this is annie laser and then andrew wilson Did not know. and like slowing it down, every good breaststroker has this kind of depth to that when the legs are extended and it happens so fast, just like how the legs then come up. And so it's so hard to notice it. I think typically, I mean, and I'll even say like, I've always, I've typically thought that it's like, you want to keep your feet along the surface and push the water back and then finish high but it's really like the legs are extending with a downward angle, pushing the hips up and then they kind of, then they rise to the surface. Um, Annie's obviously more of a 200 brush sugar, so her feet are rising to the surface a little bit slower rate than Wilson right here. But I think this is really important. I think one of the things like, Oftentimes we look at the hands of a breaststroker and say they're diving down. And if you, if like, when I think about it, people dive with the hands, I think to try to get the hips up. And I feel like if you can just have a little bit of a downward angle to that finish, people will naturally get rid of some of that hand diving. 
because with that, with, like I said, like, I do think that's an action to get the hips up and get the body, get the legs up high. Um, especially if people are just kind of keeping their kick at the surface. So just something interesting to think about. Um, and then my last brushstroke clip. So this is, um, Anton Chupkov, the world record holder and the 200 brushstroker from Russia. Um, Chupkov, like, right now epitomizes being able to change gears and brushstroke. And I think that's really important in general, being able to have like a high tempo that you can finish with. And that is prevalent for the 100 and the 200 and for men and women. Um, and obviously like, you know, in, in, in club swimming, like especially short course, especially college, like you're gonna see people spin out in brushstroke especially as you get to hundred or you're doing 200 medley relays, like people are going to spin their brushstroke and try to get to high tempos. So I want to be able to help people get to those high tempos effectively. Cause we all know that sometimes people will spin out, you know, a 50 or spin out, you know, taking out a race and like, they're just not as fast as they should be. And a lot of it is the timing is off. And a lot of it is because they're spinning with the hands. So this is Chupkov. And this is his first 50 at a one point at, sorry, this is his, the top one is his first 50 at a 2.2 tempo, like ridiculously slow. And the bottom is his last 50 of a 200 at a 1.2 tempo, which is pretty quick. Like PD's at like 1.0, 0 0.9, uh, 0.95. So this is like typically someone's like quick 100 tempo. This is like ridiculously long 200 tempo. And like equally effective. And what I want you to see is how the hands are synced up. Like even with basically his tempo is twice as fast on the bottom video, twice as fast. But look at the hands. Like the hands match up exactly. What is different? Obviously, he's gliding a whole lot less on the 1.2 tempo. Like, he's just going into the stroke. The hand speed stays the same. Crazy. And, uh, like, obviously, with less gliding, his, his feet are going to fire quicker. So, breaststroke tempo is about less glide and getting the feet coming up a little bit faster, not necessarily sooner. I mean, a little bit sooner, you can see that here. But a little bit more, it's about being faster and then pushing, like firing the feet faster too. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you can understand like when to apply this. One, it's like, yeah, every breaststroker kind of tries to rev the tempo and should try to rev the tempo on the last 50. Um, we see that, like I said, long course, short course. Um, I've studied so much tempo data uh, during COVID because that's really all I've had to look at. And so I see that long course, short course, and how do we do that well? And obviously you see that on the 200 medley relay. Less glide, fire the feet faster, somehow like keeping your hand speed disciplined and not trying to like, and that's the hard thing. It's like freestyle backstroke, when you think about tempo, it's about spinning the arms and then everything else kind of figures it out and kind of goes with it. But with breaststroke, can't do that. Um, moving on to fly. So obviously it's pretty clear who this is. Uh, this is Mary Desenza. Uh, you know, and we've had so many great butterflyers with a deep press, Michael Phelps being one of them too. Um, I guess like, you know, to be able to be really good in this, I, I would say in this kind of stroke, you have to be pretty flexible in your shoulders and have that mobility. And I think that's really important, but I, I, I think, and I respect that, I would say it's just not for everybody and more so, you know, but everybody sees like great flyers doing this and they wanna get this undulation. They think undulation is pressing deep. Uh, but yeah, like I said, like you have to be, mobile in your shoulders in order to have that. And I would say like most people just don't have that mobility. Um, 
and rather I like kind of more of a flatter press. So this is Haley Flickinger, Tom Shields, and Chad Leclo. And again, just like I would say, just trying to keep the motion forward. And, you know, with that, like looking at the head position, keep the head in line, not having the head be too deep, um, because that makes it harder when you try to come out of that press. Um, having the head, I would say, neutral and in line is what you're looking at. So we can look at these athletes as we move through that. Just like, like I said, neutral and in line with your head position, not trying to dive your head all the way down to the bottom. And here's Chad again, just like this press. Yes, you want to press, but just manage. <laughs> you know, I kind of been using this term like an appropriate amount of press, like not over pressing for most people. And obviously most people will push it to their limit, uh, but you want to be good coming out of the press. And I think being in a neutral head and a new and kind of a flatter line is typically what will lead to that. Um, and then the other thing I've been looking at a lot in fly is what people are doing on their non breathing on their yeah non breathing strokes. Um, a lot of people and I kind of see this a lot, like when people are in their non breathing strokes, they're really tucking their chin. And I think it makes it a little bit harder to get into that press. I think you want to try to keep this neutral head position a little bit more forward and neutral head position uh, when you're not breathing. And kind of chatting a little bit about some with some of our flyers about that. And not I, like obviously there's so many flaws associated with people taking breaths and fly. Um, and but I, I just also want to mention kind of what is happening on these non-breathing strokes. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And for the last thing, I only have three videos on fly. And the last thing I want to show you with fly is um, kind of tempos. Um, what I've seen, and I kind of looked at the top eight to 10 swimmers across all strokes, 100 and 200 and fly has the smallest range of successful tempos and so this is looking at a hundred long course fly men and women the the number one is the first 50 average first 50 the number two is the average of the second 50 and this range of tempos like you're basically looking at the majority, like 80% of all of these tempos are in the 1.0 to 1.1 range. And same with the women, 1.0 to 1.1. Before I kind of say what my point is in this, I'll show you the 200. So this is the 200. And we'll look at the women first. The women, like, again, most of the tempos for all of the 50s is in this 1.1 to 1. Point, it's a little bit slower, obviously, than the 100. 1.1 to 1.2. And then, you know, you can make an argument that it's like, for the men, it's like this 1.15 to 1.25. Obviously, you have this outlier where every temp, you have two outliers here. You have Diaceto, whose tempos are like, are so quick. And like, he's, he's, his average tempo on the first 50 is under one second per cycle. So you have that outlier right here. And then the other outlier is Lazlo Che, who's like his tempo is incredibly slow. Um, but really, like everybody else, the majority of their tempos are in this like 1.15 to 1.25. Like the majority of the tempos for the 100 and 200 men and women are all within a 10th of a second per cycle. And my point in this is that, and, and no other stroke has this kind of narrow range of success. And I guess the point that I, or the question that I have is like, 
if this is what's happening in a race, obviously when we get to fatigue fly in workouts, like if you were to run somebody hard and fly, their tempo would typically like get way out of this range. I would say way slower. And that's what we see with, I would say like a lot of volume fly. And most people like maybe besides the Mary T's, um, you know, their tempo is, they're gonna get to survival fly. Survival fly won't be in this narrow range that you see. And so I guess like, as we move through fly technical things, I do think the environment that you're asking an athlete to swim fly is really important too. Because without that, like somewhat kind of close to, I, you know, relevant race tempo or race where you are um, in, in a workout, I would say all the technical things fall apart. And I would say that like, you know, you, we've been hearing a little bit, a lot more about what Michael did, had done in his fly training. And it's definitely, you know, not a lot of distance stuff, not a lot of high volume repeats. I would say Billy and Luke are, were the same way when the way Billy looked at fly was not a lot of high distance, high volume repeats. And, you know, sure enough, like actually like you could see where Michael was, whoops, sorry to really, like Michael was in such a narrow range of te tempos. This is Michael right here. Like very, very narrow. And then this is Luca. And these are, our, you know, our, our Americans kind of, in, the only Americans obviously we have in this top nine or top 10. Um, but that's kind of like, I do think that like this is the only stroke that I'll really go into obviously um, non-video things, but I do think it's really important. Uh, and then I was also going to do a couple things on uh, dolphin kicking. Um, just really interesting. This is Caleb. Uh, I do think the, the kick part of it, the leg part of it is very relevant to freestyle and what I talked about there, kind of having the knees bend forward and then push it all the way through. And you could see the depth that Caleb has with his feet and where his body line is right here. Like obviously a lot of amplitude in front of his body and you don't see his kick. Like this is the high point of his kick. It is going like his knees, I would say are kind of more in front of his body. Um, but not really retracting the feet up uh, as much, just keeping the kick in front. And obviously Caleb does have a upper body motion. And I think this is really relevant and important too, like spinal flexibility, upper body mobility, uh, really important through your shoulder, through your spine. Um, Obviously, being able to impact that is really hard. Uh, I'm going to show you two more before I talk about just like one other thing that I've been, one conversation that I had. So this is Coleman Stewart, a phenomenal dolphin kicker, NC State. Um, but you can see the same kind of motion. It's obviously more exaggerated with Coleman than with Caleb, even more with the upper body motion. But he's got kind of his bend forward, like he's bending forward as he's setting up his kick and then bending backward and extending backward as he's extending his legs. This is the part, obviously people with, with not so good mobility, this is the part that people, those people struggle with is extending it back. And this is another NC State dolphin kicker, Noah Hensley. And again, similar motion through this, you have somebody like bending forward as they set up the kick and then kind of really like bending backward as and extending back with the arm as they finish the kick. I've always like, if you've heard me talk about dolphin kick, you've heard me talk about like what's happening with the legs. I've always struggled with how to really help people with their upper body motion. 
Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with John T. Skinner, who I think is always thinking outside the box. Uh, I recorded this conversation. I'm happy to send this to you. Um, I just need to finish it. And honestly, we targeted um, trying to put together some educational material for our, like targeting our national team and junior team coaches, but more than happy to share it outside too. We haven't released it yet. So when we release it, I'm more than happy to share it with you guys so that you could share it amongst your coaches too. I think his stuff is really interesting. And like, like you just obviously have to have a patience and understanding. The way he looks at it is so different from how I look at it, but I also love it. And I want to be able to incorporate it more. I am very much talking about what the legs should be doing and where positionally they should be. He talks about how you use your arms, how you can increase that mobility with the shoulders and the spine. Because I've had no clue. So I ask him those questions. And I think he's had some really good success in that. Um, so I'll, I'll be more than happy to share that with you. Um, because I think it makes it more practical that for people who struggle, um, who can get the leg action down and, the, and positions down, but then maybe not have that like good mobility uh, through the upper body. And um, hopefully it's this week. I, I mean, Lindsay was supposed to share it last week, um, but we got just so caught up in other stuff. So uh, hopefully this week, and then I'll be able to pass it on to you guys too. Um, so with that, really flew through this one um any questions and it doesn't have to be about things that talked about um you could type it into the chat you could um i mean there's only 16 of us 15 of us so you could also just like wave and then uh ask it or just like take yourself off mute and and just ask a question so um yeah happy to to kind of go through that if you want yeah, Russell, I have a question. Um, yeah. Do you have anything on turns that you could share with us? Yeah, I, so I don't have anything set. Um, like, I, I made all those videos just so, like, I could, like, to be – because most of my high-quality stuff doesn't play well over Zoom. Um, I would say – I mean, I could try. I also probably would spend most of the next 10 minutes probably looking through and trying to find it all. Um, but I, you know, generally, um, like, the things that I look for in open turns, uh, I would say it's a little bit more unique now in terms of, like, I like people coming around to the side rather than going straight back. Um, i seeing more and more of our NC2A – swimmers doing that and moving towards that like just really rotating at an angle as they're doing open turns instead of just like head and hands coming straight back um it just sets people up on um uh, it sets people up for their feet position a whole lot better as their foot comes up they kind of come up at an angle plant the feet here and it just sets them up better to get a better push as opposed to like coming up straight and then kind of turning and like most, like I see so many people push off with their feet like this, like just like lined up behind each other or even like really weirdly like crossed in the wrong way. And that's how they're pushing off the wall. Um, so obviously blending that kind of motion on the open turn. Um, and then on the freestyle turn, I would say the biggest thing that I look for is um like are people using their hands to to help push water over and and some of our national teamers aren't like i want to see the hips obviously come over towards the wall and then so as the hand finishes just turning the hand and then pushing water over to help get the hips over help get the head down all that ah! kind of um oh excuse me hope, hope everybody's okay uh <laughs> or Anyway, um, so hope that like those are the two things I would say the first things I look for because I see it so those are the things I see so often is like bad feet position on the wall for open turns and then um, 
and then not using the hands and the, and the hips coming over really slow. Um, yeah. In the chat from Mark, um, what are you noticing with the difference with KO's breakouts versus competitors? Uh, first is underwaters are ridiculous as we know, but like, like what he's doing is he's also like taking an extra dolphin kick with his first freestyle stroke. Um, I think that's one of the biggest differences that is so hard to master. Like Phelps did it pretty naturally and Caleb does it pretty naturally. I don't know anyone else like that. Like it is pretty hard to, to incorporate basically a, a, a one-arm dolphin kick. Like he's, he's dolphin kicking, like doing a down kick as he's going through his first pull on freestyle and then transitioning. And it's so, um, yeah, it's so, I, I would say like, just take, helps him take advantage of one more kick. Obviously timing is key with that. Uh, as with all dolphin kicks, but I think that's that's one of the big things with him. Um, you know, and I've seen it where his timing isn't good, but you know, when we get to the world champs and when we get to um, you know, hopefully the Olympics, like he's typically good in those in those scenarios with that timing. But it's not always like that. And I think like just to me shows it's something that you have to work on and, and keep reminding yourself on. Uh, Ricky asks, we've all been able to see Lucas swim locally. Uh, good reference for coaches. Any thoughts in his fly? Like, uh, he is an awesome catch. Um, awesome in his tempo. Uh, Billy and I have talked about this. I, I mean, typically, he, he, like, he is one guy that I would say, like, you know, presses a little bit deeper. And, I, I mean, and I've cautioned Billy with that. Um, just w in terms of, like, I think just something to look for and look out for. Um, and obviously Luca is, is obviously seeing so much success in it. Like I would say he even pressed deeper than Michael did. Um, and I, I'm more worried about like the drag that it creates when you try to lift yourself out from that deep. Um, and obviously you have to find that balance because obviously like Michael and Mary DeSenza and Luca, so good and so effective in that um you know and, and generally I, I try not to and my first instinct isn't to change like these exceptions I, as much as like put it on people's radars like if there's an opportunity going forward uh like if you know th if there's something going forward that you would want to touch on then maybe that's that so um i don't know billy if you want to say anything about that too or not just even that but just luke in general yeah, same thing. I think he's been working uh, since a shoulder injury on flattening it out a little bit and trying to find that forward, you know, continuing to find the press and the depth, but not having the, the same um, depth out in front. So forward more than down. Um, so the, he's going to continue to work on it, but it was, it was looking pretty good when he went off to Georgia. So. And I've um, heard like, you know, I've heard that, you know, since he's gotten down there, it's been really good too. So. Yeah, it, it, he's good. I mean, he'll, he'll come together. <laughs> um, hey, my question real quick while, I'm, while I got you on here is, uh, I know we last time I heard you talk, you talked a lot about breaststroke rate and how the world-class breaststrokers are kind of hitting that certain rate. Has that not narrowed the pull cycle for those guys? Is that, has that become different or is it still the same cycle? They're just speeding up the up kick and the, and the leg tempo with it. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, so yeah, the tempos are definitely quicker. Um, I don't think it's really narrowed. I mean, for someone like Petey, like his stroke is, is way more compact. If anything, it's kept the stroke more in front as much as, you know, instead of shortening, instead of making it more narrow this way, I think they've kept the stroke more in front of them. So shortening this way, as a, not shortening this way. And I think that's kind of where things have gone. Obviously, Lily's a little bit of an exception. Like she's got this high tempo and her hands are literally hitting her chest every single stroke. But I think she's the, kind of the exception of that. Like she, I mean, you saw just like, she gets this catch isn't coming out as wide. Um, obviously more of a hundred driven than, um, I, you know, I think a lot of us want to, um, 
you know, have brush strokers that are good 100 and 200. So, you know, someone like Chupkov, who you had at 1.2 and 2.2, like that, that depth didn't really change. Uh, that width didn't really change. I think if anything, you know, I think the, the, the option to change in that pull would be how deep you're pulling back, how far you're pulling back. Um, if you want to change something in addition to the, the glide and the kicks and the kick timing. I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to ask one more while I'm on. Yeah. Um, the backstroke rotation that you were talking about. So I, we have a lot of kids that over-rotate through the hips and get stuck on that one side like you were talking about. Have you seen any drills or any thought process, like progression process, that gets them out of that habit of, of trying to find the through the shoulders and less through the entire body rotation? Yeah, I think, you know, the key is like when people are doing like a six-kick switch drill, is like not going all the way on your side and kicking here. It's like going to here and kicking. Like you're, you're still on like towards that side, but maybe not going all the way. And I think that's what we teach or what we have taught is like getting the shoulders up, getting onto that side completely. But if you can kind of get to at an, you know, get to that side at an angle, I feel like that can help. Um, you know, so that you're more balanced and not having to rotate all the way across, which you don't see people doing. And, and you don't see the hips going all the way from one side to the other uh, with these great backstrokers too. So I think that's like, it's just, you know, I don't have any, any like mind blowing drills, just like, you know, reusing the drills. And now obviously like if you do like a three strokes, you know, and then six kicks, like kind of having the same thing, just like, keeping it more realistic in that aspect. And I do think like when they, if they're just kick, taking six kicks here, like they'll be able to engage the pull right away as opposed to like, I, like if they're all the way on their side, that first stroke, that stroke just isn't really realistic in what people want to do. Cool. Pull on the lane rope. And I would just say like, when you do that, like, like most people, when people cheat to pull on the rope, they're like pulling with their, leading with their elbows, but just like keeping the hand, uh, you know, keeping the hand and elbow kind of in line as you're doing that. Well, thank you so much, Russell, for taking the time to, you know, come and talk to us and show us all your cool videos and stuff. It's, we really, really appreciate it. And thank you yeah. for the record. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I hope everybody, you know, stays healthy, happy, positive. As I was saying, just you coaches are, are the foundation of USA Swimming and, and the heart of it and what we do. And I absolutely have seen that more than ever and appreciate you guys always and the time that you do and what you're doing for all of your athletes. So, uh, you know, hopefully I, we can see each other in person again soon. And I look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah, we, we're ready to see you out on a pool deck. <laughs> yeah, you guys have a good night. Enjoy your dinner or your other meetings if you have any. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you guys. Good seeing you all.